distinguished participants and speakers, let me welcome you to this webinar at the instance of Chatham House International Affairs webinar series. And thank you for finding time to join us for this important discussion. Before I proceed, as it is always the practice, uh, let me inform you that the proceedings of this webinar will be recorded. But it's not for attribution, uh, at least you know the rule is Chatham House. Dear friends, before I proceed to provide overview of this discourse, permit me to introduce our distinguished speakers. I have been given an enormous task by Chatham House to moderate a webinar that has as one of its speakers, my teacher and former professor, also former board chair of the West African Network for Peace Building, where I work as the executive director, Professor Isaac Olawale Albert, a professor of African history and conflict studies and current dean faculty of multidisciplinary studies, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Also speaking in this event are two other renowned international subject matter experts in the persons of Bruno Chebrion, Professor of International Studies, the Director of the Center for Security and Crisis Governance, Royal Military College, St. Jean, Canada, and Sini Maria Kold, Senior Researcher, Danish School of International Studies. With such eminent speakers, let me thank Chatham House for the privilege of making me the moderator at this very important discourse. Dear friends, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as an overview, my reflection starts with the exponential growth and impact of violent extremism to the stability of states and human security in West Africa in recent years. The operations of Boko Haram, the Islamic State for West Africa province in the northeastern part of Nigeria, have snowballed to destabilize other recurrent communities of Lake Chad Basin countries, such as Niger, Mali, Chad, and Cameroon. Across the Sahel region, the insurgency of terrorist groups such as Jamaat Nasril Islam, JNI, Islamic State Group in the Greater Sahara, and other violent extremist groups have exacerbated the multi layered security crisis and altered existing local dynamics to heighten state and human security fragility of the countries in the region. Compounding this challenge is involvement of terrorists and armed groups in organized crimes, particularly piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, which has become an operational tool for the resource mobilization to sustain the activities in the region. The threat profile of this insecurity has both external and internal implication for the littoral states of Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, and Togo that borders Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. The external relates to current trends in regional security dynamics, including the return of foreign terrorist fighters, illegal migration, IDPs, and refugee flow. And of course, the impact of resource on the resources such as food, water, and land. The second dimension is a cocktail of internal issues, including political disputes, unresolved local conflicts, enduring porous border, weak regulations of manufacturing and exploitation of arms, increasing criminal activities, strategic resources, and weak state presence in border communities. In an effort to build resilience, we have witnessed bilateral and multilateral level preventive, or what you may consider as mitigation actions, such as the African Union and ECOWAS instrument on countering terrorism and violent extremism. AU and ECOWAS integrated maritime strategies, the Accra Initiative, DG5 Sahel, multinational joint tax force operation Banki in France, MUNISMA, as well as the national level response strategies in the Lake Chad Basin, Sahel and the littoral states. Key actions of civil society organizations, I have no doubt that we have the best of the brains to help us reflect and rethink the engagement and the role of various actors to make meaningful impact to the prevalent seeming complex situation. With this background, I am pleased to invite each of our speakers to make their opening statements on the subject matter within six minutes in the following order, beginning with Professor Isaac Albert on the effect of Abu Bakr death on terrorism and the fight against insurgency. Professor Albert, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. 
and thank you Chatham House for this opportunity given to all of us. Uh, let me start by providing some background information about Abubakar Shekau uh, until 19 May 2021 when he was killed. Uh, he was the leader of the Boko Haram sect, uh, which has been ter terrorizing the West African you know, sub-region for quite some time. Uh, the question posed is uh, for me to discuss the effect of his death. I will simply say that after the death of uh, Shekau, uh, we realized that Iswap, which is Islamic State of West African province, uh, took over the Boko Haram crisis. Uh, you know, Iswap has its base in the Middle East. It was, uh, it had a relationship with uh, Boko Haram, but with the death of uh, Shekau, uh, Iswap took over uh, Boko Haram. Now, this produced to me three basic problems. The first is what I technically want to refer to as actor proliferation. The second is what I call issue proliferation. And the third is what I call management complication. Now, to start with actor proliferation, this what has its base in the Middle East. It is an, you know, a product of IC. Now it has taken over a problem that started in Nigeria and that spread to the Lake, you know, Lake Chad Basin countries. Now the problem is Nigeria. The problem belongs to Lake Chad Basin countries, but now controlled by a militant organization that is based in the Middle East. Now that is what I refer to as actor proliferation. Proliferation. Now, where you have actor proliferation, you are going to have issue proliferation. If we have to call a peace meeting today on Boko Haram crisis, you will have the Lake, Lake Chad Basin countries sitting down with a group that has its base in the Middle East. How? What are the issues to be discussed? What is the problem of Israel with Nigeria? What is the problem of Israel with? Uh, like child basing country. I think what is manifesting is that I see intends to use this uh, problem to strengthen its stronghold of the West African uh, sub region. And what I foresee in future is for I see to use the Boko Haram crisis as a strategy of proxy warfare. Uh, against uh, its enemies across the globe. Now, to prefer to prepare for this uh, war, uh, expanded version of the Boko Haram, uh, Iswap is busy recruiting uh, new fighters. Uh, we 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 had a report a few weeks ago that Iswap is busy recruiting uh, fighters from from Libya. Within Nigeria, it is kidnapping uh, young people taking them to Sambisa Forest for training, and it is also paying some Nigerians to become its, uh, its fighters. Now, as I started to experiment with what might end up being its war strategy. And this war strategy is what I would refer to as hard target attacks. You know, it is busy attacking, you know, military installations, attacking war commanders, and this is a product of um, its existing strategy. Even before the death of uh, Shekau, you know, Iswap is known for attacking super camps, attacking strong military uh, formations, and it is actually building on that, and I think that is having uh, a very, very negative uh, impact on uh, the, 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 the conflict. Now, we have also discovered that since the death of Shekau, Boko Haram crisis has gradually been expanding to some other parts of Nigeria. For example, in the northwestern part of Nigeria, we now have presence of Boko Haram. In the North Central, we have presence of Boko Haram. So the scale of the problem is expanding. 
Now, the Nigerian military is also doing its best to towards actually, uh, you know, sizing up with the nuisance value of uh, Israel. For example, as a result of the military operations in Nigeria that has been upgraded, uh, we have recorded so far about 30,000 uh, ex-fighters from Israel, you know, surrendering to the Nigerian state. But another matter arising from this is, does Nigeria have the capacity to manage 30,000 ex-fighters? And this reminds us of the problem that we had in Rwanda, when we had the, the, the genocide in Rwanda. Many, many criminals were arrested, locked up, but it was difficult for the country to manage the prisoners. And the country had to come up with what, you know, is called gachacha. Gachacha is a local, you know, uh, reconciliation mechanism. Now, the question I will ask here is, what is going, what, how is Nigeria's gachacha likely uh, to look like? Um, let me stop at this point and, uh, and allow the others actually to have the floor. Thank you so very much uh, for that initial opening, uh, uh, Prof. Once again, let me inform participants that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, let me now invite Bruno to make his uh, initial opening remarks on the effect of French interventions on governance uh, 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 and, of course, in the um, fight against terrorism and uh, insurgency. Bruno, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the organization for being here today. Um, so in essence, I guess I'll talk to, to, to the paper I, I just published in a re, you know, recent issue, the latest issue of international affairs. So in which I tried to do essentially two things. Uh, one was to look back on almost a decade of conflict and intervention in Mali in the Sahel to reflect on what had happened. And more importantly, in what had been built, so what type of political order or governance, if you will, had emerged since 2012 following the crisis and intervention. The other thing I tried to do was that um, I thought that debates about intervention in Mali and the Sahel had reached an unproductive dead end, so to speak. You were for or against military action. You were supportive because as the main claim goes, there is no denying the terrorist threat. You were against it uh, or against military action or focus on military action because military operation cannot solve the conflict. So there was a binary here where one was either uh, for or against military intervention or the focus should be on military governance issues. So to me, it was uh, in many ways a circular, it is a circular argument that doesn't lead, uh, uh, that leads nowhere in, in many ways. So I wanted to put it simply to take seriously both arguments, however, while examining their assumptions of how they work uh, against each other. So I developed uh, the concept of counterinsurgency governance to point to the influence of counterinsurgency principles and their infusion into philosophies of governance. So in this sense, I, I politicize, I tried to politicize counterinsurgency. Uh, and, and in my mind, counterinsurgency does not simply inform military techniques of combat, but is a form of politics in and of itself. So my theorization allowed me to analyze a form of counterinsurgency governance in Mali and the Sahel that insists on a set of power relations and configurations that imposes limits, parameters, boundaries on the purpose of Sahelian states, on, the, on governments and governance and the forms that they ought uh, to take. So the theoretical work I, I tried to do highlights the ways in which international commitments in the Sahel are not technical solution to local and regional problems and internal conflict to be solved by external actors, but instead a mode of ruling or a mode of governance, if you will, that participate in the constitution of the object and the subjects it seeks to secure and govern. So the purpose of theorizing counterinsurgency was to analyze the political logic and effects of military thinking and therefore to interrogate, interrogate the assumptions sustaining ideas about the use and utility of military force in Mali and the Sahel. So here I took inspiration from lots of work on the history of counterinsurgency. And so historically, 
To summarize, the general idea of counterinsurgency is grounded in colonial assumptions about the need to civilize, govern, and or control subject populations, which is something you probably all know. But what's uh, probably more interesting, certainly for my purpose, was it's the codification of counterinsurgency to philosophy of governance that I was reflected and is reflected in the frequent, defin uh, frequent, frequent, frequent pardon me, definition of counterinsurgency by its proponents as armed social work. So the idea here is that the soldier must participate in or at the very least support community work, reconstruction of schools and hospitals, political mediation, economic development, and so on and so forth. So in other words, it's quite clear from the very beginning of counterinsurgency thinking that the use of force is tied to the idea of civilization or as, or as we would call it today, development. Today, we call that conjunction or that, that, that connection between two terms, the secure development nexus. So in other words, you can't really oppose military solution to other governance or political uh, focused solutions like development of governance. Uh, and so I tried, and I think we must unpack the politics of military solution and how a military solution are intertwined with other types of intervention like development intervention. So doing so in my article allowed me to examine how security and stabilization works as mechanisms for disseminating, promoting, and imposing philosophies of governance or philosophies of uh, development. Put another way, focus on analyzing a set of assumptions about the use of military force as an instrument of change, as an instrument for social engineering, and so on and so forth. So quite clearly from the start of 2013 in Mali, that's what the French were working on. They were working on historical assumption taken from their own counterinsurgency textbooks, the global approach as they call it now and similar concepts that have been deployed since 2012. And then essentially make the claim that military operations create the necessary space for politics. You clear, you hold, and then you build. And the building is to be done by international agencies with local partners. So development and governance and so on uh, must be done quickly so that military gains are not lost. That's the military doctrine. But really my question was how, how are the limits of political order and rule to governance, to violence and well-being, to security, to development, established and enacted a situation where military intervention, international intervention, became integral to the continued existence of salient states. In other words, how is permanent military intervention tied into the very functioning of salient states? So counterinsurgency in the Sahel to me is both simultaneously a, a mode of governance and a web of political practices and contestation that's failed miserably, obviously I would say. Instead, however, it reproduces its logic of perpetual uh, intervention as integral to the po very possibility of sound states. So its practices are found in other, other locations, not only in military practices and construction of regional security apparatus that reproduces the stale as a non-governed space in need of perpetual uh, military intervention, but also in, in many sectors of the development world. It's not clear to me, however, what such international conditions mean for the future of salient state and societies, how the more so if we add uh, to the current challenge and those of a global pandemic and climate change, but it certainly seems to me very unlikely that sustaining these conditions of perpetual war will lead to, uh, it's very unlikely that they will lead to peaceful resolution of salient conflicts. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Bruno. Um, I, will, I will definitely uh, ask you to deepen uh, more of those um, uh, angles that you have provided. But in the meantime, uh, let me also inform the distinguished participants that I'm looking at some of your questions and once the uh, panelists are done uh, with the initial uh, uh, questions uh, and their remarks. I will be picking some of your questions and posing them to each of the uh, panelists as you direct them. But in the meantime, let me invite Sini to speak on the wider unintended effects of some of these interventions, especially in the Sahel region. Sini, you have the floor, the audience. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and also thank you for Chatham House for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to discuss such pertinent issues with uh, such distinguished scholars. 
Um, I will focus on the role of intervention actors in this fight against terrorism, with particular focus on the EU and its role in the Sahel. And I've also been asked uh, particularly to comment on how these interventions and intervention failures reflect back on Western or what has been termed liberal intervention actors um, and the EU and European member states in particular. So uh, the EU is just one actor in this broader security governance apparatus that Bruno has just laid out for you. Um, but in many ways, the EU is a key actor in the Sahel, or as I will argue uh, the other way around, the Sahel is also key to the EU security activeness that is in constructing its um, ability to provide global security. Um, since 2011, the Sahel region's perceived cross-border security threats of terrorism, migration and organized crime um, have become a top uh, security priority for the EU. So the logic is very much um, similar to the logic of the US-led war on terror that we need to fight these increasingly complex and perpetual risks um, and dangers before it reaches the European continent. At least that's how policymakers lay it out to, uh, to the public. Um, so in that sense, West Africa's Sahel region also offers a powerful case of how the EU is defining or redefining its um, international agency and role as global security provider. And this also brings in the question of some of the broader implication of what is at stake for Western interventions actors in the Sahel region. And in the perspective of the EU, I think also the recent dramatic end to the American-led war in Afghanistan accentuated this idea of European strategic autonomy. Uh, we can discuss uh, whether that's a reality or not later, but um, at least on a, concept, uh, on a conceptual level, it was um, uh, re-articulated with the end of the war in Afghanistan because the wish for the EU to sort of demonstrate its willingness and ability and capability of providing security in the Sahel. And in this um, context, the Sahel is often framed by European policymakers as the EU's extended neighborhood. So one thing is, is to what extent Western interventions in all kinds of collaborations with local partners can achieve in terms of pursued uh, security goals in the region. But another question is also how this failure to achieve whatever ill-defined goals of stability will reflect back on the role of the West and its ability to pro provide global security, uh, which I think is also at stake um, here. Um, so the first point I want to make here is that at times completely disconnected from development on the ground, the Sahel is indeed this laboratory for the EU's geopolitical ambition to demonstrate agency and ability to provide um, security. However, at the same time, um, after the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the political appetite in European um, 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 uh, cities for deploying a large number of troops on the ground has also severely diminished. And therefore, these interventions that we see in the Sahel are increasingly shaped in the form of what has been termed light footprints or proxy war um, framed in a language of security partnership. So the idea is that through um, training of local security forces, equipping foreign troops, um, as well as through increased technology and drones and all kinds of um, communication uh, technology, we can sort of manage and counter these threats from afar with less risk for European soldiers, while risks are being increasingly outsourced to security partners in, uh, in these partner countries. Of course, Bakken, one could argue, is uh, um, it's different because there is military troops, but we also see increasingly less political will in Paris for uh, more deployment of French troops in the Sahel. <clears throat> but of course, this sort of outsourcing also comes with a set of indirect, unintended, and at times catastrophic intervention effect, uh, effects. Because with the distance and the outsourcing, Western interventions actors also become increasingly detached from the events on the ground. 
Um, and the West also becomes uh, comes to rely increasingly on these problematic partnerships with mo multiple local actors that has varying, varying resources and sometimes dissimilar goals. Um, so perhaps what I would like to stress and also challenging Bruno a little bit on this, um, there might be logics and philosophies behind these interventions, but it's also important to recognize that interventions do not travel uncontested from policy office in New York, Brussels, or Paris. They are indeed contested and resisted and at times circumvented by actors on the ground, but often in tacit ways, although recently these um, protests against uh, Western military interventions are becoming uh, louder also in the capitals of the region. And this also brings me to a third point about how actors on the ground are, per are perfectly able and capable of shaping or taming interventions according to their own agendas and interests. Like when soldiers trained by Western security actors end up leading coup d'etats with deeply destabilizing effects. I think the political in, uh, turmoil in Mali with two coups in a year's time vividly illustrates this point. Um, but this also brings us back to uh, um, the first point about how we're perhaps seeing also changing perhaps more multiple order world, because it's not just a uh, Western or a liberal interventions actor that are engaged in this health. Actors like Russia, China, Gulf states, Turkey are also increasingly involved in the region, all serving their own geopolitical interests, sometimes with the main purpose of destabilizing the West, sometimes for economic interest or market shares, weapon deals or what, uh, uh, whatever those different agendas may be. And this is not new, of course, uh, there are historical legacies to this, but the stakes are up as military engagements have intensified. And that also increases the room of maneuvering for the local and regional actors that Western intervention actors rely on for carrying out their own security interest. So Europe ends up being engaged uh, for different reasons than creating and securing peace and stability. Um, they're there because other actors that European member state conceive of as detriment to their own interests are there. Um, and they are afraid of who's going to fill the vacuum if they leave, despite this eagerness to withdraw. So while there has been much talk about French withdrawal, also after the end of the American led war in Afghanistan, um, I also agree uh, with the, the point being made that we are perhaps moving towards more permanent presence, uh, but yet through these interventions at a distance. So despite um, Hollande's promises of a quick fix in 2013, we are perhaps moving towards uh, perpetual wars. And I'm gonna stop there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me bring back uh, Professor Albert for, uh, to comment on two things. Uh, first of all, is that as operational taxis and the modus operandi of uh, the terrorists continue to mutate, uh, the response strategies seem to be static. Are we adopting a response strategy that is fit for purpose? And if you could also respond to one of the questions raised by uh, one of the participants about how did the death of uh, President Idris uh, Deby further compound the fight against terrorism in the, in the, in the Sahel region? Prof. I'd like to say that uh, the present Nigerian situation is very complex. Complex in the sense that when you are dealing with a problem of this nature, uh, one would expect you to start by framing the problem. In conflict management, you start with framing. The framing will tell you the actors, will tell you the power of the actors, will tell you the, the network of relationship they have, will tell you their strategies, but I do not think that our interventions are preceded by scientific framing of the problems. And this is because some of our interventions are usually out of the books. They are not actually, they do not address the problems. Uh, 
let's take the case of Israel. Before Shekau was killed, uh, Nigeria prioritized the strategy of super camp. You establish some camps where the military will be stationed permanently, you know, and what super camp ends up doing is forcing on us a defensive mechanism rather than actually going out there to attack the enemy. Now we have Israel, which is now a specialist in demystifying, in the demystification of super camp strategy. So to me, I think we have a problem there. And then before the death of Shekau, we have always been preaching the need for us to engage in what one would call community engagement. You know, many of the communities where these terrorists operate do not have sufficient contact with the state. Most of them belong to those, you know, they belong to those uh, that in history we refer to as Kanem Borno Empire, relationship across the borders. But many of these border communities have been abandoned for, 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 for ages. And therefore, they find it easier to relate with the terrorists than the state. And that is why many of them now have agreed to be paying taxes and protection fees to the terrorists. Now, the present situation requires that Nigeria cannot but continue to strengthen its military strategies. I'm not a supporter of military approach to management of some of these problems. But if this one is constantly attacking the Nigerian military, we cannot be recommending other options than for us, for, than for Nigeria to continue to use kinetic strategies. Unfortunately, Nigeria does not have the right kind of armament for fighting this battle as a result of the international community's refusal to sell arms to Nigeria. So Nigeria is having problems acquiring necessary arms for fighting these terrorists. So my recommendation here is that the international community should see the, 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 the new turn of events in Nigeria, the conflict between Nigeria and Israel to be an international problem. Because if Israel is, is successful in making Nigeria more ungovernable, eventually the goals of Israel and the goal of IC in establishing the West African sub-region as a safe haven will be attained and everybody will suffer for it. So my advice is for the international community to please support the Nigerian state with arms, there's a need for Nigerian states to be supported with fighters because ISWAP, ISWAP is recruiting foreign fighters. Now, your, your, the second question, which has to do with the role of Idris Dhabi. Idris Dhabi played a significant role in helping us to deal with the Boko Haram crisis. Most of the arms that Boko Haram fighters use, they come in through Libya. And in this case, you have two types of weapons. The first type of weapons are those that came directly from the armory of Gaddafi. After the death of Gaddafi, the armory, you know, the armories were looted and Boko Haram fighters were found with some of these weapons. But I argue that Gaddafi's weapons have been exhausted. But the, the, the but, but, but the ports of uh, Libya, it's not so porous that arms are coming in freely from that angle. Now, when Idris Dhabi was alive, he helped us to prevent the infiltration of these arms into Nigeria and the other parts of Sahel. But since he left, I do not know whether his successor has been able to demonstrate the capacity to help us to prevent infiltration of arms, infiltration of foreign fighters. So uh, to me, I think the death of uh, Idris Dhabi is a minus for the fight against Boko Haram. Yes, Prof. Do I have two more minutes? 
Uh, maybe one minute should be fine. Okay. Now, first, first, in this forum, I really want us to take some lessons from what happened in Afghanistan or what is happening in Afghanistan. Nigeria took many years to acquire Tucano jets from America. And what we were told that was that the Tucano jets are going to be game changers in the fight against terrorism. But we saw in the case of Afghanistan that America provided hundreds of these military aircraft. You know, Afghanistan was provided with Ibrahim, you know, armored uh, vehicles, but the, 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 the Taliban strolled into Kabul. And then we have to ask ourselves some questions. The questions, or the first question is, does the amount of weapons that a nation have, does it actually determine your capacity to defeat terrorism? My answer is no. You need, you need patriotic military. You need political leaders with political will. You need a country that is held together by the leaders. And then you need a community where ethnicity and religion is not or are not the primary philosophy of political governance. You can acquire all the weapons in this world. If the political will is not there, you cannot defeat terrorism. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, let me also inform our distinguished participants that all the article relating to the uh, subject matter as have been provided by the panelists are all uh, online and you can also assess it uh, on the chat box. Uh, it has been provided uh, there for you to assess and do your further reading. Let me now bring back uh, Bruno, Bruno on two issues. Number one is that a, a lot of experts have alluded to governance deficits and of course, over-reliance, which already Professor Albert also alluded to, over-reliance on hardcore security approach as a key factor militating against the, the efforts at preventing and countering violent extremism. How then would you situate this within the interventions of the international uh, community, which seems to be focusing only on hardcore security as well? Uh, then also, if you can combine that with one of the questions that is raised by one of the participants, who says that if you are looking at the French operations in the Sahel region, how then do you understand events that happened a few weeks ago where uh, a convoy uh, was not even allowed by the population to move across the, the forces? Uh, does it mean that the locals no longer welcome the international actors, or, or what, or is it a, a, so, something to do with trust? Bruno, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, well, let me start with my, my, my answer to your question, um, the, and maybe to some of the point that Signe mentioned. Um, intervention is R&D fragment, and there, there, there are multiple actors. There's a multitude of intervention, especially from Western world. So, we, but, but having said that, I, I believe that uh, Western actors share assumptions, uh, and they, they, they can be found in security development nexus, to, to put it simply. Um, and to me, beyond the security development access is the counterinsurgency logic I was talking about that sustains uh, this multitude of military actors, but also their civilian counterparts. So international organization, development practitioners, stabilization consultant, uh, humanitarian actors, so on and so forth. And, and, and I would agree with what Signe said about the EU in the Sahel, taking the Sahel as a lab laboratory. And, and I would add that ultimately the, the, the collision between a, a Western intervention, European led intervention with local regional compensation or regimes and, and so on and so forth, I'll get to that in a moment, lead actually to an international strategy of containment, uh, containing the effects of conflict, conflict rather than actually finding solution. I don't think there's much political willingness to actually try to help our, our Saudi friends to, to solve uh, uh, the conflict right now. So 
in practice, uh, whether it is a secure development nexus or what some people uh, uh, argue for, uh, which is an emphasis on governance, what we see on the ground is that funds and investment to rebuild and develop the state are substantially insufficient and overly concerned with technical matters. Politics is evacuated or avoided in many ways. Uh, for instance, and again, I, I, I probably speak to, to uh, Signe's point about the European Union, uh, stabilization through governance or through development has enabled the outsourcing of European security interests and agendas and externalize European borders into Africa. So to me, the question is not so much about, well, we need governance or governance solution. It is in, in the Sahel, or what some people have said, uh, governance in the Sahel is hollow. To me, the question is rather about the form of governance that is wanted, prioritized, and put in place right now as we speak. So the key question is, therefore, the set of power relations and configurations that counterinsurgency governance and the counterinsurgency logic imposes and or seeks to impose. And I emphasize he here seeks to impose because it's not always succeeding, right? Um, these relations and configuration therefore form the conditions of possibility that will enact and enable particular limits and boundaries on emerging forms of governance and political organization that we can find in the Sahel. So the interaction and collisions between these competing orders, political orders or modes of governance or philosophies of governance, if you will, are also framed by post-colonial legacies of military and development intervention. The international management of the uh, post-2012 crisis, I, I think, needs to be set against the historical background of what some have called the politics of permanent crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. That goes back to the literature of the 1990s. This is not new. Prior to 2012, for an independence, for instance, was a key component of the post-constitutional life of Sahelian state. It shaped the identity of the region partly. Like, again, I'm not, I don't want to undermine local and African agency here for sure. I'm talking about those collisions. But, but th this sort of, of foreign independence paved the way for a project of massive reengineering re politics in the Sahel. I, I could uh, uh, talk about a few examples here, but I'll, I'll skip those. Um, so both before and after 2012, population have been construed, I think, as the problem because of their poverty and vulnerability as both at risk and risky for regime stability, and thus, thus neglecting legacies of intervention and dependency structure and the, the, the colonial legacies and so on and so forth. So it is, I think, in this historical context that we find the most interesting work uh, from people like us can include. And I would say, uh, hopefully, I, I've engaged with that too with, with my colleague, Jonathan Sears. So Oskin and, and Kluge can argue that the post-2012 moment is nothing less than a renegotiation of a post-colonial order. And so they analyze basically forms of governance beyond that of the modern state to unveil the notion of governance space as a normative term to justify Western intervention in the Sahel. And so jihadist group and armed groups, for instance, in this framework are conceived as political actors, not irrational terrorists, who deploy a variety of practices and strategies to rule and direct challenge to state sovereignty, but also in direct challenge to international authority. And this is the sort of like rebel governance work that's really necessary to focus on what that means to talk about governance in the Sahel and to some extent what it means for state formation and state governance. But I, I, I think that such approaches have largely neglected the international conditions of these localized emerging modes of governance. And I, and I like to think that Markle seeks uh, to, to fill that gap. Where how, what are the international conditions within which we can find these emerging rebel local state uh, modes of governance? So to conclude very quickly, um, counterinsurgency governance in Sahel to me has worked effectively to minimize sustained engagement beyond the use of force, and I, I agree to increasingly remote use of force uh, with competing normative orders, sites of authority and legitimacy, non-state centric governance, and so on and so forth. So as military efforts have failed to even bring a modicum of stability to the security situation in Sahel, what I think we observe right now is a formation of regional strategy to manage, suppress, and contain the emergence of alternative philosophies and modes of governance, one that permits a transformation of regional security governance 
Uh, and I could talk here about the transformation, originalization or transformation of Barkhane. Uh, and the end result is that international actor offer very little uh, to no conflict resolution beyond the recourse to endless military intervention. So I don't know if I have time to answer the convoy question or if I spent uh, I, I talk too much, but. Uh, if you could take one minute, since the concern raised by participants, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, this is uh, this is really interesting because in in many ways, what I think is happening has been seen before. It's not new. Contesting uh, French intervention, for instance, in West Africa, is something we we saw in many other places, and in particular, I've seen it in the Ivory Coast uh, uh, during the conflict uh, about the, a decade ago or so. Uh, and in that sense, I think. There's both a legitimate concern and uh, uh, protests against French intervention, its limits and its, uh, let's say, negative impact and so on and so forth. At the same time, it plays uh, uh, within a particular setting and context where France becomes the uh, um, the target of our critique. It's a, it's a bit like climate change, uh, like we hear, uh, for instance, I, um, to make, be clear, we hear African leaders saying, well, conflict is explained because of climate change. Everything that goes on is explained because of the French presence. So it's a way to depoliticize question, but also to, 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 to avoid responsibility for, for what's going on. And I'm not saying here that the French don't have their part uh, and the responsibility in this situation for sure. But but I am wondering, I guess, about that sort of local politics within those countries that, that protest uh, French intervention. And, and to end that question, I, I, I recall very clearly in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ivory Coast, uh, the contradiction of that protest. So you had the same person, I could talk to the same person, they would both say, it's all because of the French. And at the same time, we don't want the French to leave, otherwise we'll just kill, kill each other. In other words, it's their fault, but at the same time, we need their help. And I think in the Sahel, we are confronted with that contradiction again. Thank you so very much. Sini, I'm now coming back to you on two different fronts. First of all is that we seem to now be at a crossroad. It appears none of the approaches is working uh, at least to holistically uh, prevent terrorism, especially in our own part of the world. Uh, and a lot of people have also alluded to some of the systemic or structural issues that even give rise to uh, terrorism. So is this something that you think we should look at or we continue uh, just confronting the symptoms? But also a participant is also asking why the focus just on West Africa when the issue is now becoming global? You know, I think uh, it's also a dimension that you, you may want to touch, Sinin. Okay, thank you very much for, for posing that question. I think actually also perhaps drawing on some of Bruno's former work, I think uh, this idea of how you construct subjects um, in West Africa in terms of who's terrorist and who's not terrorist and you kind of in the different intervention setups for instance the peace agreement with Mali you define certain actors as non-political actors that you cannot negotiate with and I think perhaps that's also uh, what characterizes the the approach to uh, the fight against terrorism is this idea of that are that there are subjects that are kind of unreachable. Um, so I think one approach that could be uh, interesting in terms of um, uh, turning away from a dead end is perhaps um, reconceptualizing this idea of like a West against Islam or this tendency to escalate conflict narratives both by actors and jihadist actors in the region, but also by political actors in Europe, for instance. I think it's been a very clear red line by France that they don't want to negotiate uh, with terrorists, despite that um, states in the Sahel has uh, explicitly 
um, set and and also on the very local level uh, these kind of peace agreements do take place uh, so I would call for a more um, pragmatic approach perhaps uh, realizing that um, this is of course extremely difficult uh, to sell to countries in in Europe that has been attacked by um, or has uh, um, been um, attacked by these terrorist organizations. But it's also very clear, for instance, when you look at um, the groups in the Sahel, or one thing that is unclear is actually, uh, and what Western policymakers is also struggling with, is to what extent are these agendas regional, local, to what extent are these agendas at, at all uh, aimed at targeting uh, the West. Uh, there's no, um, uh, if you take the case of central Mali, it's not necessarily the case that the Katibas uh, major, uh, Masina's major objective is to strike uh, any kind of targets uh, in, in, in Europe. So I think actually being more pragmatic about um, and what these groups want and what kind of uh, governance, as uh, we have talked about, um, they're aiming for and what kind of um, gaps they are also responding to uh, would make uh, it more feasible. So um, yeah, I think it's very interesting that, that France is taking the same approach the, uh, to the US in terms of uh, the politics of, of red lines. Uh, which I think has worked uh, very much to the detriment of um, uh, so, uh, making concrete solutions. Um, yeah. And I think also perhaps if I should say something about this aspect of the many different uh, foreign interests that are uh, at play and what it means for, for European interventions, I think there's nothing knew about this has also been mentioned many of these countries and elites in these countries has been recipients of foreign aid and there's always been this sort of playground or um, room of maneuvering in terms of uh, forum shopping if you can't get uh, this uh, with one of the donors, you can go to the other donor to perhaps to get that. I think what's new in this context with these more uh, militarized actors is the extent to which we also see, um, for instance, the Malian Junta and some of these state elites can actually use it in terms of put pressure on France, for instance. Um, if they don't do what uh, the Junta would like them to do, they can go to, to for instance, uh, the Russian Wagner group. So I think it's, it's more this sort of performance and the performativity of that kind of, of a negotiation that is, is new and is also displaying the extent to which uh, European interests are also being squeezed uh, in the Sahel at the moment. Thank you so very much. Uh, dear distinguished audience, as always with uh, webinar, times are always very short. And um, uh, but I think today you will agree with me that our region is in the grip of various destructive forces that is redefining our status to a region of instability and a failed region. Although efforts as preventing and countering terrorism may appear to be failing, I, I think that the trends are reversible. Right? They are reversible. Uh, if you adopt some of the approaches provided at this webinar and also uh, further reading uh, through the, the link that is provided, uh, I think that the timely interplay and the intellectual engagement with and between civil actors, policymakers, and international partners could indeed contribute to arresting the drift and put this region on the path of peace and sustainable development. Please feel free again to assess this article uh, via the link that has been provided. It has been a pleasure for me and honor to be asked to chair this webinar. And I hope that you have enjoyed the webinar as much as I have I now invite you, dear friends, to join me in appreciating our very wonderful panelists. I also thank you, the participants, for your very, very kind engagement.
and I look forward to uh, sustaining this engagement. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.